and welcome. This is More Than Autism, Neurodiversity and Sensory Processing. Uh, again, my name is Laurel. I travel this. I am a, the aquatic supervisor as well as a challenge course instructor and outdoor education instructor here at the Northern Virginia 4-H Center. I also am a parent who is homeschooling as my children include my son who has autism and my daughter who has auditory processing disorder and dyslexia. Um, the first thing we have to talk about when we start talking about neurodiversity and sensory processing is that we absolutely have to start from a position where we not only understand, but we totally believe that behavior is communication. I have found that with people um, in the experiential education industry, that that tends to be a place most of us can start. We all agree to that, particularly in a therapeutic setting, but a lot of times in the educational setting, it can become difficult to continue to have that emotional buy-in into the idea that behavior happens for a reason, and that reason is not because the little kid is defiant or trying to make you angry. That that behavior occurs because there is some kind of any drive from that child or an adult um, that they have a need that's being expressed or met through this behavior. And ultimately, I think that we have to all start from this position where we recognize that children want to impress adults. The children want us to be proud of them. And so when we can start from that place where we agree that everybody does what they do for a reason and that their reason is self-driven by something they need, not as, as opposed to driven by a need to make someone around them angry or uncomfortable, then we can be in a position where we can open our minds to some of these sensory concerns. So I'm going to, I gave you this example in the PDF that was sent to you, but I'm just going to quickly read this. This was a Facebook post from Asper Kids. So if you follow Asper Kids, this is an adult um, woman with autism. Her husband as well as her children are diagnosed with um, Asperger's, which is a form of autism. And so she's a national presenter and has written a book called Asper Kids. She um, shares what she calls an Asper Kids superhero kit. So if you register your Aspie with super Asper Kids, you'll get a kit in the mail uh, recognizing their Asper awesomeness. So she was describing a day where she was uh, out with her children. Sometimes the simplest sensory solution can make all the difference in the world in curbing difficult behavior. Look for sensory fixes first. For example, my littlest guy was on the verge of a full public meltdown yesterday morning when he should have been enjoying a beautiful autumn day and a yummy treat. After I got him to smell the roses and blow out the candles, so that means to breathe deeply, I do a fast assessment. What's the problem? The donut is sticky. What's the solution? Mom asked the salesman for a piece of wax paper. And so the result is that he was able to hold the donut without getting messy or tearing it to bits. He enjoyed a new food, he played with other children, and best of all, she got to have her coffee. So again, this idea that behavior is communication, that if you're seeing a kid do something, there's a reason. And so it's our job to do some of that detective work and look for those reasons, and sensory is often the first reason. So neurodiversity as a term is something that's been coined in the autism community to refer to this idea that the neurological system is infinitely diverse. Every nervous system, every body, every brain is built differently. It's important to understand that when we're talking about the neurological system, we're not referring specifically to the brain. The brain is one part of a whole neurological system. So recognizing that neurons run throughout the body and that they receive information from the environment, pass that information to the brain where it's processed, and then are responsible for sending information back into the body to react to the environment. That entire system creates many opportunities for variability. So what we find is that people who are diagnosed with autism are neurologically diverse, that there's this great diversity in all these differences that people have. We say in the community with autism that if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. So most people with autism spectrum disorder have a constellation of symptoms and comorbid diagnoses. So this particular graphic has been most useful for explaining what those comorbid diagnoses include. So I would encourage you as you're looking at this particular graphic, if you have any specific questions for me about things on this graphic, by all means, use that Q&A box and let me know. One of the things that I see a lot of times when I work with younger adults, so I'm talking about teens and college age students who are going to be working as camp counselors, is they look at this and they're like, oh, I have ADD, I'm autistic. That is not what this graphic is saying. This graphic is saying that all of these little circles on the outside indicate conditions that are considered comorbid. 
so they are related to the autism spectrum. You absolutely can be diagnosed with any of these conditions that are on the outside circles without being diagnosed with autism. You can also be diagnosed with autism without being diagnosed with any of those outside circles. What's important here is to understand how these diagnoses are awarded. So for those of you who are not familiar, the, um, the medical profession has a diagnostic journal it gives a list of criteria by which the doctor has to decide whether or not somebody has whatever they have. These are neurological disorders, so this is not like, oh yeah, we see the arm broken. This is, we're looking at a list of behaviors. Does the patient exhibit XYZ list of behaviors? And generally the way these work is you might have a list of 11 behaviors for that particular diagnosis. We're saying that if the patient uh, is able to demonstrate seven of those behaviors, that would be a majority, we're gonna diagnose them with that label. What we find with autism is a lot of times they'll actually show behaviors that are in many of those outside circles, but not enough to actually warrant a diagnosis. So they have four instead of seven, or they have six instead of seven. And so they have a tendency for one of these other diagnoses without an actual diagnosis. So as an example, my son is diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. He is formally diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder and with ADHD tendencies and with anxiety tendencies because he doesn't exhibit the full battery of behaviors that would warrant a full diagnosis. Um, also, you should take note that this list of diagnoses around the outside is pretty vast. This is everything from oppositional defiant disorder at the top auditory processing on, on what would be the west side, um, anxiety over on what would be the east side, giftedness near the bottom. There's a whole lot of behaviors that are listed here. Does anybody have any specific questions at this point um, about what some of these diagnoses are or the behaviors that we might see with any of these? I don't see any, any questions popping up, Lorelai, but I'm kind of curious if, if you could go into a little bit more detail uh, about s sensory integration disorder, uh, something I haven't really heard of before. Excellent. So this actually has a couple different names. Um, when this disorder was first established, it was called sensory integration disorder. It's now called sensory processing disorder. Um, that particular diagnosis has only been included in the diagnostic manual in the last three or four years. Basically, it was noticed by occupational therapists, and it was not a popular diagnosis amongst doctors because it was something that therapists saw first. But ultimately, it's recognizing that that whole neurological system that absorbs information from the environment through the senses and then processes re-expression through the body into the environment through the senses, that somewhere in that function, there is drastic variability. We're seeing someone who is not integrating their senses. Um, and really this discussion, I'm going to talk more about that. You'll see some of this behavior as I show a video of some of the stuff my son does. But the idea is that, for instance, your vision sees the universe. In fact, your vision sees the universe upside down all the time. Your inner ear, your vestibular sense senses gravity. There's a bubble in there, like a level, that's sensing where gravity pulls on you. And so those two senses together work together in your head so that your head puts things right side up when you see them and you see your environment. So a lot of our motor coordination then is actually determined by our vestibular sense as well as our vision so that we're moving our bodies in space because we can see where we are and we can feel where gravity pulls us. When all of those senses, the motor coordination, the vestibular, the vision, when they're not integrated and working together well, that's when we see a lot of really odd behaviors. So one of the things I do on the challenge course often that you can kind of test this with is blindfolding. I don't know how many of you use blindfolds, but it's kind of my weapon of choice on the challenge course. And I find that when you blindfold somebody, they lose their sense of balance. They, they really cannot find where they are. So when you have that kid on islands or you have that kid on TP shuffle or an adult <laughs> and you blindfold them as part of your increased challenge because they're not following the rules or whatever, now you see that the team has to step up and provide more support, like more actual physical contact with their body in order to provide information to their head for them to keep their balance because you've removed their vision. 
hope that clarifies some of that. It does, thank you. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> So one of the things that we really need to think about here is that we're not talking about a processing error. This is a really famous saying that we use in the autism community, that it's not a processing error. It's a whole different operating system. So this is the difference between Macs and PCs. You would not purchase PC software and expect it to work on your Mac. You would not purchase Mac software and expect it to work on your PC. This does not make the Mac wrong or the PC wrong. It makes them totally different operating systems. So when we're talking about that great diversity in our neurological function, we're talking about the fact that, that what works for one person doesn't work for another person. We know that. We see that all the time as educators. What we're saying is that that is infinitely diverse and a full spectrum of diversity. And so just because it's really different doesn't make it wrong. It just makes it really different. So sensory processing is the key there. Again, as I've said now twice, information must move through the senses to get to the cortex to be thought about. And after you think about it, it must move back through the senses in order to be expressed. So here's an example. Um, this particular book is a really cool book called Duck Rabbit. Um, I'm actually going to go ahead and show you a video of this book. If you've never read it, it's kind of fun. While we do this, there's going to be a poll that opens up to ask what you see, whether you're seeing the duck or the rabbit. All right. Hey, look, a duck! That's not a duck, that's a rabbit. It's totally a duck. See, there's his bill. What are you talking about? Those are ears, silly. It's a duck, and he's about to eat a piece of bread. It's a rabbit, and he's about to eat a carrot. Wait, listen. Did you hear that? I heard duck sounds. That's funny. I distinctly heard rabbit sounds. Now the duck is wading through the swamp. No, the rabbit is hiding in the grass. Here, look at the duck through my binoculars. Sorry, still a rabbit. Duck, rabbit, duck, rabbit, duck, rabbit, duck, rabbit, duck, rabbit, duck, rabbit. So again, this whole conversation about whether it's a duck or a rabbit, which are both correct. It is both a duck and a rabbit. And this idea that where you stand, um, and really even that kind of analogy, where you stand doesn't affect this, but it's about perspective, that neither one is wrong, both are correct. This is actually a book I, I specifically purchased to share with my son to talk about differences and perspective and, and making sure that we could accept uh, that other people see the world differently than we do, that we don't have to agree on everything every single time. Um, did we do a poll there? Did anybody decide whether they saw a duck or a rabbit? We did. We're, our group is split evenly uh, <laughs> between duck and rabbit. It sounds like a, a pretty epic battle. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that, I felt like that book was a great example of of how we – look at the world around us and we see totally different things even when the same thing is there which actually i mean really our whole universe is built on this watching all of the tv shows about criminal justice type stuff is all about those different perspectives so this slide really speaks to some work from temple grandin who if you're unfamiliar she's a very famous adult autistic she's a university professor at the university of colorado in animal science She's written a couple books about autism, about what it was like to grow up with autism, and what she sees as the consistent patterns in autism. And what she really points out is that what we're seeing as autism is an extremity. That all of these attributes we're seeing in autistic people, we have them too, but they're extreme in a person who's living with autism. Specifically, those attributes that we find um, kind of concerning to us is that perseveration, the root word there being persevere. So again, the idea that if the senses are not integrated, if they're not all working together and something's out of whack, then we're seeking something that provides stability. That perseveration is very often an expression of that need for stability. 
whether it's an obsessive topic or an obsessive action which you do with your hands, whether it's stimming, which is short for self-stimulation, or whether it's being very rigid in your routine, all of those things are about providing some kind of stability in an environment that's overwhelming because the senses are not integrating all of that information together. Basically, what we're seeing is a kid that's awkward, that they're overwhelmed, and we're thinking that they're just weird, they're odd, you know? And I don't mean that necessarily in a negative sense at all, but we're looking at the kid thinking, they're really struggling to fit in. There's something about that kid that's, that's not where everybody else is. Basically, all of us in all of our behavior are either seeking input or avoiding input based on how we perceive our environment to create that stability. So this slide is going to go through a, some graphics. And each of these graphics represent uh, people doing stuff. And basically what I'd like you to do is to go ahead and use that Q&A button that you have and go ahead and describe for me how these guys basically um, relate to campers or students that you had. Have you seen this camper? Have you seen this student? So we're gonna go ahead and add some more guys up here. I will acknowledge that all of these particular stick figures are male. Um, first of all, that's what I found when I was going through clip art. Secondly, I would also use this as an opportunity to recognize that autism is diagnosed in boys um, four times more often than it's diagnosed in women, so, or girls. So it is definitely at this point something that we see more in the male population. There's a lot of discussion about why that may or may not be if we're just not observing. Um, it's beyond the scope of this particular conversation, but um, it is one of the aspects of autism. So we're looking at these guys doing all kinds of different stuff. Um, basically, I want to know what you guys see them doing. How would you describe some of these guys? Have you seen this camper? I know some folks are a little shy to use Q&A sometimes, but I'll go ahead and speak it. The, the, the one holding the clock definitely speaks to me of that student. And it, it's very much in terms of when's the next meal is what I usually get. The food stressors, right? When are we, when are we doing this? When is this happening? That, and I've had some debates with, I, I did a lot of work with Outward Bound and a lot of debates with co-instructors about whether or not you should give them that information or just try to be in this present moment. Right, well, and I found that too, especially in this particular industry. Um, and that's a really awesome discussion. So I find for my son, when he's asking me when something's gonna happen, he's either doing one of two things. He's either identified a situation that's really uncomfortable for him and he's really trying to figure out how long he has to do it. Or he's identified a situation that is comforting to him and he wants to know when he gets to do it again. Again, what he's looking for is how long do I have to put up with this? So I want you to imagine, you know, being at the dentist, an uncomfortable situation for the vast majority of us, and they've got your mouth stretched out with thing, and they've got sticks in there, and there's this sucking device, sucking spit, and you're, the dentist leaves. The dentist leaves. And you're sitting there thinking, dude, how long do I have to sit here with all of this stuff in my mouth, and am I indefinitely here? and he's gone, and he's gone, and he's gone, and you can't ask questions, and the guy doesn't come back, and you're like, are you serious? That's the kind of anxiety that, that's being addressed when the camper or the student is asking you what's next. You know, whereas if the dentist says, that cement has to sit there for two minutes. Well, as long as it seems, you know it's really only two minutes because he said it was two minutes. Whereas if they said nothing and left, now that's where that anxiety builds. So let's talk about some of these other behaviors um, that we're seeing. Um, the guy with glasses seems pretty happy-go-lucky, pretty smiley. Um, definitely, those are some pretty Coke bottle glasses on this particular graphic. So it may be possible that we have some vision perception that might be an issue. Um, the next kid over here is jumping and clicking his heels. Well, you know, again, I would love that camper, right? He's super happy, but 
maybe he's super perky, like we've all had that one kid where we're like, dude, you clearly, you know, should not drink coffee in the morning. Um, or the kid who runs all the time, we run into this kind of kid at the pool all the time. You know, the lifeguards are literally telling this child to walk every five minutes, and they're not capable of walking. And my son was described that way by his grandparents on more than one occasion. Is that well, the child needs to walk. Dude, he can't. His body doesn't walk. <laughs> That's a life skill that hasn't come yet. It'll come in time. Um, being super loud, you had this camper, you're watching this camper, and you're thinking, man, they have no volume setting. Maybe they don't. Maybe they can't hear how loud they are. Maybe there's some hearing loss, or maybe it's an auditory processing issue where even if there's no significant hearing loss, the brain itself is not able to translate all of that electrical signal into language, basically. Particularly when you're in a, a setting with lots of background noise. So my daughter has some auditory processing issues. And so one of the things we've noticed is that if the radio is on or if the TV is on and we're talking to her, she has absolutely no ability to hear what we say. And even if she's watching our face, like providing that visual input with the auditory input, if there's background noise, she's not going to hear it. Which kind of leads to the guy next to him who's you know, asking what. Like, she's always asking us what. Well, her head can't hold that language because of the way her head processes sound. Now, movement is a whole other story for her. Um, you might have the kid who's juggling, right? They've always got something in their hands. I will say that I have found in the challenge course industry in particular, camp people and and challenge course people tend to be these people. They're the people who are constantly fidgeting. If there's a ball in their hands, it's gonna to be tossing. Like there, there's no ability to just hold the ball. Like holding the ball doesn't happen. It's either squeezing the ball or gently tossing the ball, whatever, like it's, they're not gonna hold the ball. Um, this graphic on the bottom with the pie chart of pizza is particularly interesting to me. Um, I feel like that one represents my son pretty well because I feel like it represents two things. I feel like, first of all, it represents that consuming information. One of the um, attributes of Asperger's in particular is this idea that you conquer lots and lots of detail. They call it the little professor syndrome. Um, again, there's theories about why that's happening, um, but one of the theories is that they're not connecting the dots. So for instance, behind me is this bottle cap mural. If every single piece of information is a bottle cap, there's no picture until you get all the bottle caps together and you can see the tree or the sky that, that, that brings the whole thing together. Um, but this picture also can represent eating in general, right? We've all seen these kids. They chew on their sleeves or they chew on their hair or, or they're just eating. My son is known for eating grass and other random things, not poisonous things usually. Um, but Again, this idea that, that they're eating something, and again, there's several reasons for that. Their absolute pica is a diagnosis that's given for someone who really has some kind of mineral or vitamin deficiency where you'll consistently see that they're eating one thing that provides some kind of vitamin or mineral. My son um, does not tend to eat one consistent thing. He eats everything. So we think that he's looking for information in his jaw, like providing pressure, gritting teeth, grinding teeth, chewing gum, all those things can provide that input to the jaw. All right, so basically all of these guys kind of are demonstrating behaviors, and I would argue that all of the behaviors that you're seeing here are sensory driven. So this is another representation of sensory driven behavior. And in fact, the PDF that was sent to you just before today has the chart that's on the lower part down here. And basically, I often encourage participants to just read through this chart and tell me, have you ever seen a kid do this? Have you seen the kid who hates getting dirty and is sensitive to the texture of food? Have you seen the kid who only responds to play if it's active and involves pushing and pulling? Have you seen the kid who's easily overstimulated, they're covering their eyes, they can't handle the bright lighter colors? Have you seen the kid who and loves the shining, spinning, bright objects, or enjoys the TV super loud, or enjoys really noisy crowds. Um, or the other way up here, you know, certain smells make me gag, or I dislike having my hair combed or washed. All of these behaviors 
um, are sensory driven behaviors. So what we need to understand is what senses we're talking about. So this is where the conversation um, gets really interesting, actually. So the list that is on the left represents what I like to call the five kindergarten senses. So hearing, sight, touch, smell, taste, you know, the where, brown bear, brown bear, who do you see kind of senses. When we're talking about sensory integration therapy or sensory processing disorder, we're also recognizing that there's two more senses, and that's the vestibular and proprioceptive senses that are listed on the right side. What's interesting about this is that we really, all of us, recognize and use this information, um, but it was occupational therapists who kind of gave it language. So I can say as a classroom teacher, I used strategies to manage student behavior that involved proprioceptive and vestibular input before I had words for those things. As an autism parent and my child's going through intensive therapy and I'm being given words for these things, I'm thinking, well, yeah, like we all do that, don't we? Like that's how you manage a situation in your body. And but it's it's very different to be in a position where you can actively give vocabulary to that. So the vestibular sense is that inner ear, which I've mentioned before, the idea that there's a level, you know, there's a little chamber and there's cilia and the cilia feel where the bubble is. Again, we're talking about extremity when we're talking about autism. So classic behaviors that we think about is the whole, the, eye, the lights are too bright, right? There's certain lights that bother me. You all may notice, it's kind of hard to see because the image is kind of small, but there's actually an undulating wave through my image in that little box. That's from the fluorescent light in this room. The light in this room doesn't work correctly and provides a shaky light. It actually gives a lot of us headaches. We almost never turn this light on when we're in this room for that specific reason. Um, or the other way that can be with sight, if you're rather than being too perceptive, you can be under perceptive. So maybe someone who likes really bright colors, you know, they're looking or a lot of high contrast. So their, their vision just doesn't see things quite the same way. Um, hearing can be the same. We can all we all are okay with saying, well, some people like rock and roll, and some people like country, and some people are into baroque. And okay, well, that's exactly what we're saying. Every single person is different because the, what you actually hear is different than what everybody else hears. And again, there's that extremity that sounds can be too loud. So we talk about like the buzzing of fluorescent lights or the buzzing of street lights that not everybody can hear, and people with autism spectrum disorder often can or the other end of auditory processing that they're not hearing all that background noise. Touch, same way, touch on the skin, texture of clothing, tags and clothes. This also can do with food textures, either an aversion to smooth foods or an aversion to crunchy foods kind of thing. Smells, which smells a whole other universe of fabulousness um, because it's actually a different part of our brain. Taste where your taste buds are on your tongue again like it's very sensical right I only really have four or five areas on my tongue to taste of course my tongue may have a bigger bitter area than salty area that it seems like that variability would be acceptable and we can agree that some people like Mexican food some people like Italian food some people like Chinese food again this idea is this extremity the idea that we can take this difference and accept a broader spectrum of it the vestibular sense the same so if you are a vestibular seeker, then you're seeking input into that system. That's where you're going to see the kid who just spins and spins and spins in the grass. Adults who love roller coasters are vestibular seekers. In the pool, we a lot of times see them as vestibular avoiders. The kid who has trouble floating on their back. The kid who has trouble tipping their hair in the bath to have their hair washed. Someone whose motor coordination reflects a vestibular sensitivity. They have slow, awkward, calculated movements because they don't feel steady on their feet. There's a certain level of clumsiness to that. And then proprioception is kind of the counter to a vestibular. In the therapeutic setting, we a lot of times use those together to counterbalance each other. For example, proprioception, so is the idea that all the nerves in your body register pressure and that's how you build a three-dimensional picture of where your body is in space we use proprioception instinctively the child cries they're upset you hug them you're providing pressure to the body thunder shirts that are made for dogs for anxiety are the exact same idea that they're providing pressure to the body 
Again, the extremity is where we get concerned. Either someone who's proprioceptive sensitive, the kid that can't stand to be hugged. A lot of times that's something we talk about in as parents in the autism community that there's this whole idea that they can't stand being hugged. Well, their body may feel that pressure in a way that's, that's very difficult for those of us who are not feeling it that way. It's a real attack on their system. Or the other way, the kid who doesn't feel where their body is, and so they're constantly touching something. They're constantly leaning on something. In occupational therapy, we call them melting children. Um, every time they walk through a room, they're literally leaning on every object in the room. My son is notorious for when he talks to you, he's going to grab your arm and he actually pulls on your arm as part of how he's engaging with you because that's how he's finding you and finding him. So I have a really great video to kind of demonstrate that proprioception. Um, so this video, just to let you know, is one that I took of him driving in the car. It does have quite a large auditory piece. I'm going to let it run for probably about 20 seconds. Again, you have that Q&A box. Feel free to ask me any questions if they come to mind. Um, but I'm going to let this run for a couple minutes, or less than a minute, a couple seconds, and let you watch how his body seeks that proprioception. And I would encourage you to think about the other sensors that might be engaged in this activity. So as you can see, he starts with the banging of his arms, um, and then he moves to the pulling on the seatbelt, a lot of pressure there. Then he starts with the kicking of his legs. So you can see we're in the car. You can see the windows down. We've got a lot of sound with the wind rushing. Obviously, we're passing the 18 really there. It gets even louder. The wind's actually on his face, so there's this whole blowing sensation. And you can see in the window that the vision is flying past, right? So his senses are not registering a sense of place. They're overwhelmed with information. And so his body is seeking that sense of place through proprioception with this whole idea of pressure on the body. For him, these kind of behaviors of the, of the kind of moving in these hard motions, what we call the hand flapping, sometimes banging on his own legs, these kind of behaviors help him ground where he's at. And he exhibits them very often. You can tell watching this, he's completely unconscious of the fact that he's exhibiting these behaviors because this is what his body needs to function all the time. It's just who he is and what he does and how he moves around in the universe. Any questions about any of the sensory discussions so far? I'm still not seeing Q&A, so I'm just going to go ahead and move forward. But by all means, if anyone has any specific questions or if this triggers a particular story, by all means, please feel free to go ahead and, and jump in there. I'm all about answering questions. So I'm going to move forward into this idea that all memories are multi-sensory. So this is really important, again, to this conversation about sensory processing, because every single piece of information that's going to get into the brain has to get there through the senses, and it gets there in more than one way. We know this. We've talked about this as educators for ages. Specifically, we refer to it as learning modalities. This idea that we're going to make sure to present information orally, auditorially, and kinesthetically. But when we're talking about recognizing that those memories, which if you want a kid to learn, you want them to remember stuff, that those memories are more than just even those three senses. That there's a larger network of neurological connections that's occurring with every single thought and idea. And so again, at camp in particular, but also in the classroom, we tend to offer that information orally. We're going to say it. We're going to sing it. We're going to tell stories. We're going we're to have all this auditory input. We're going to offer that information visually. We're going to provide graphic organizers, and we're going to provide maps, and we're going to provide actual factual pictures, and we're going to provide drawing pictures, and we might have icons for particular activities, thinking like the Olympics, right, the universal icons for all these different sports. Like, we're very clear to communicate in those graphic means. What's also important, though, is to remember that in brain uh, 
brain science, when we're talking about how the brain holds on to those memories, the brain holds on to those informations in a chunk. Chunking is the term that they use. So the brain's not going to remember one thing. The brain's going to remember a body of information. And the more ideas are connected to that information through multiple pathways, the more opportunity the brain has to remember those things. So offering those big picture explanations, answering the why questions, make a big difference in whether or not kids with autism, ADHD, opposition defiant disorder, all these spectrum disorders, whether or not their brain is going to hold on to it. If it's not relevant, they're not going to hold on to it. And again, more and more brain research as far as education continues to prove that. Now let's look at this from the sensory side and say, okay, we agree, they're not going to remember it if, if it's not important to them. But let's recognize that the way their body press up, processes their environment may be vastly different from any other student or from ourselves. And so determining relevance will require a conversation with them specifically. So I'm going to have you do a little experiment here about multi-sensory memories. The next slide is going to start with a word. So I want you to read the word and I want you to think about the first image and memory that comes to mind with this board. Now it's going to go through a series of images regarding this word. And it's certainly acceptable to argue that all of these are cake. Even though they're really, really different. There's a big difference between German chocolate cake and carrot cake. There's a big difference between the graduation cake and the wedding cake. This last cake here is a dragon cake. My children get dragon cakes for their birthday every year. So is there anybody who wants to share any specific memory of cake um, in that Q&A section maybe that, that came up for you? I can tell you from, from my cake stories. The first one is I remember a birthday cake. My family grew up in California. We went to my to the beach for my birthday every year. And I distinctly remember the first time we went to the beach taking a cake and the cake got full of sand and it was horrible and we could not eat it. And I never had another birthday cake ever again in my life. Like birthday cake as a cake is not one of those positive memories for me. Whereas wedding cakes the other way. So uh, a lot of thought obviously goes into the wedding cake, a lot of excitement. I was doing great the day of the wedding. I was you know, hitting my list and we had all the stuff to do. It was totally fine. I was having a big old plate of barbecue for lunch and she brings in my wedding cake and I thought, oh, that's my wedding cake. I'm getting married today. All of a sudden the nerves hit and everything was, was pretty crazy from that point forward. So is there anybody who has any specific memories about cakes that they'd like to share? Maybe that memory that you have a cake is actually about the epic cake fail, right? Maybe it's a funny story. So there's lots of different memories that one word, and again, multi-sensory memories. This is not just the taste of the cake, or the sight of the cake, or the smell of the cake. This is also gonna include what you heard while you were around the cake, the people who were there, the whole situation around the cake. Again, every memory is gonna be multi-sensory. So this is going to talk about the most effective strategy I have found in any environment to deal with autism and autism spectrum disorders and the challenges those behaviors give us. Front loading, I mean, it's that simple. So this in particular is something that's really debated in the challenge course industry and in the experiential education industry about front loading. We really like to harness this whole idea of uncertainty and use uncertainty as a tool to increase engagement. And it does, it absolutely increases anxiety in the participants and so it creates a sense of a heightened emotional activity which creates a stronger learning memory. All of that's true. But again, remembering that in the autism community we're talking about extremity. So that little bit of anxiety for someone who is neurotypical, which is how the autism community calls normal people, non-autistic people, that little bit of anxiety in the neurotypical person becomes astronomical amounts of anxiety that can stop a person from functioning. So front loading becomes a really effective strategy in managing that level of anxiety. Explaining schedules and sequence of events, creating familiarity with the space can be really important to success. Identifying both the mechanics and the story when you're going through those challenge course 
um, challenges. So for instance, spider webs a common one. Our story here is about how it's a web of lasers. And you and your team are an elite force. They're gonna rescue the historic artifact on the other side. It's a great story, man. Totally creates buy-in. The lowdown is you gotta get your team from this side to that side, and you can't touch the rope. What does this require? Let's think through and predict the skills that we're gonna have to use to complete this task. Am I gonna have to lift people? Am I gonna have to contort my body? Am I gonna have to have that vestibular sense of being sideways? Um, am I going to have to, whatever it is that you have to do, do I have to support others and feel that proprioceptive sense of lifting? This is also really important, particularly I find in the challenge course industry and experiential education about this challenge by choice idea. We are, it's a standard, we use it, use it specifically to talk about this idea of stepping into challenges, but recognizing the challenge by choice also includes that sensory component. So if a participant is saying, look, I understand what's expected, I've hit my threshold, I require a break. That's challenge by choice. And that doesn't mean stepping out of the activity entirely. It means taking responsibility for managing your own sensory needs and saying, I need this, you know, minute, I can't do this, I'm gonna step be able to step back in later. Making sure to give people time to process autism is specifically a developmental delay. That's the language that's used medically. Giving people time to process is really important. In the classroom setting, that can be even more important. Studies have shown that classroom teachers often spend less than three seconds of silence between the time they ask a question and they call on somebody for an answer. So again, if you're dealing with someone who's overwhelmed by their environment and they're processing all of that, that delay that you're seeing is helping them sort through all of this neurology and information. Um, I really think that the big deal about sensory processing is that it actually creates an opportunity, particularly on the challenge course, for the team to support each other, to have that open conversation that says, look, you know, I know that I need you all to be quiet for me to think. Okay, well, if you know that, then the team can respect that. Let's agree as a team to give you two minutes to think, and then we're gonna take two minutes to openly brainstorm because somebody else needs to think out loud. So again, being in that place where you can self-advocate because you understand your sensory needs is really important. Another big deal that's come up um, in our autism story that I would like to point out to you is this idea of cumulative overload. So again, this excerpt is in the PDF that was mailed to you, but I'm gonna go ahead and read it. The sensory, social, and cognitive challenges at school can be very stressful, building an accumulation of stress chemicals as the day rolls on. They tax the nervous system. They drain the brain, resulting in an overwhelming stress chemical buildup. When getting home, these children need time to rebound. For some children, they may need to isolate with a favorite activity, escape to a favorite self-stimulation. Some children rebound better with physical activity for 20, 30 minutes. Some children may need to take a nap. Whatever strategy your child uses, allow them time to rebound and re-energize. So again, that's where that self-advocacy comes in about knowing how your body functions. What does your body need to refunction, to recenter itself? Um, a growing research with adults with autism is showing that many of them have chronic PTSD symptoms and chemicals and, and attributes in their body. And a lot of that is attributed to this idea of this overwhelming chemical buildup of stress chemicals because they're not being socially allowed the time to recenter their sensory experience and get their body functioning however they need to. Like they're pushed to the breaking point more often. We all do it. We all have been under super big stressors. An emergency comes up in our life and suddenly we can't cope. What we're saying is again that autism is about that extremity, that those meltdowns, that threshold is closer and so it gets crossed more often and then there's this level of being disrespected well dude you just freak out about everything well no i mean maybe they do freak out about everything and maybe that's okay like maybe that's how they function and we as a community need to provide support for them to deal with their freak out um, i will say this was a huge issue for us as a family and it became a physical safety issue my son actually developed a rare autoimmune disorder and his capillaries began exploding all over his body. We were having his kidneys tested every week to make sure that he was not having his kidneys compromised um, with the outcome of this particular immune disorder. So again, when we talk about that cumulative overload, this isn't just a matter of emotional security, it's a real physical threat to people who can be living with autism. 
in a camp experience, we see this all the time too. Wow, they did great the first day of camp. They did great the second day of camp, the third day of camp, the fourth day of camp. But the kid just couldn't last the whole week. Maybe they can't. Like maybe that's where we need to both change the schedule and accommodate so that they can be equipped the last little week. Um, this last slide about front loading is going to be in reference to that last little piece about um, social stories. So social stories is something that's used in the therapy community to help you, the adult, and the person who's living with autism to co-author a story that clarifies whatever. It clarifies expectations of behavior. It's done before something happens so that they have that whole psych up, I'm aware of what's happening. It's done after a problem. This is the alternative behavior we would like you to display. The whole idea is that you're co-authoring this. So I do have um, a website that I'd like to share with you um, of a particular camp that I found that does a really great job of including these key components of who, what, when, where, why, using actual photos. Um, let me get it up here. So I particularly think this website is effective. This is me top summer camp in Maine. Um, because it does go in chronological order. It's got your schedule, right? David's going to wake up in the morning. As I come over the graphic, I have both the graphic and an actual photo. And I can link through to even more information. Um, one of the things I say to my son very often, because fear is overwhelming for him, what conquers fear is knowledge. The more knowledge you gain, the less you have to be afraid of. Again, so it's a chronological order. David's going to pass through his day. I come down here to mealtime. Got a little movement to catch my vision. Again, actual photos so I can become familiar with the space. Um, again, mealtime is fun. As chance interrupt, announcements are made and stories are told. So again, prepping the participant to know that this is going to be a loud space. Stuff's going to happen here. That was a real issue for my son at Boy Scout camp in particular. The, the tradition of the tables, you know, beating, banging on the table, we've got spirit, how about you kind of thing, where that's sudden, like there's no warning when that stuff happens, and intense. So again, being in a position where they can accept that uh, or be prepared for that to happen. So David moves through his day, we talk about his activities, and again, this is great that they list actual activities over here so I can find out what I'm actually going to do. Again, our camp uh, here at 4-H gives them some choice about which classes they're going to take control over their environment, knowing how long things are going to last, giving them a sense that, that they're not at the, the subject of everybody else's whims. As you got got pit, afternoon activities. Again, this would be where you would want to look at traditions, right? What is some stuff that we know to do? So here at our camp, there's a different afternoon activity every day. So again, there's a lot of change in that schedule. You think you know what's going to happen. It's afternoon event, but it's actually different every single day. Preparing him for those kind of changes um, has been really important to his success at camp as well. Um, but also this idea that it is a rest hour, that I, as the participant, already know that there's going to be time built into that program for me to recenter, for me to refocus in some way. And then moving through to, you know, the other idea, free time, swim time, again, giving an explanation about what free time means, you know, those expectations are clear. Free time may not mean that I literally get to wander around. I have to stay within a specific space. And then those campfire traditions moving on to, uh, to end the day. And again, TAPS is played by 9.30 p.m. and we go to sleep, knowing that there's an end to all of this overwhelm. I will be allowed to sleep. Matter of fact, they want me to sleep. They want me to be successful. All of those things can be really important. Um, so basically, I would encourage you, I mean, I, I, for us too, our kind of first course of action has been to kind of create these uh, social stories, basically, about our camp, about our traditions, our routines, to empower our participants. Um, one of the other kind of accommodations that we've had to make here at our camp is increasing supervision ratios. When we have a kid like my son who gets overwhelmed, one of the great stories was they were lined up for a campfire one night um, by pack and my son was a little overwhelmed and so he stepped out of line and started rolling in the grass and the camp staffer comes up to me and says he's rolling in the grass and i'm like yeah should we stop that is he hurting anybody like maybe he needs to roll in the grass maybe he's 
finding activity for him, it's proprioception, but also separate from others, standing in line is a lot of contact with others. So that means that his physical self needs to remove from that group supervision situation. So by increasing the ratio of supervision, we create a space where if the kid needs to take a walk, you can make that, well, you can't go where I can't see you, um, but you're allowed in this space. And I, as the adult, am now really watching him do that as opposed to being responsible for him and 15 other kids, four other kids. No, no, you guys have to stay right here because I have to know where you are. Creating space for them to take that kind of sensory break and recentering. Um, the other thing, again, some of these simple sensory accommodations um, that we found really successful this year. So this is my son's third year here at camp here. One of the things he really struggled with was the noise level in our dining hall. So the first several years, he ate outside. They have a porch alongside the dining hall. He ate outside, so there's no roof and walls to reverberate all of that sound. Um, he wasn't eating when he was in the dining hall, which is a problem if you're going to be here for a week. This year, they've actually um, been able to include him in the dining hall experience by changing where he sits at the table. So the tradition here is that there's a long table and the, the counselors sit at the end. By the counselor sitting along the long side of the table and allowing my son to sit at the end of the table, it gave him enough physical space that he could stay in the dining hall and cope with that. So again, for us, having watched him over a series of years, that's a big deal that he's been able to experience that group meal uh, conversation experience. Um, so this is kind of the, the end of my little slide here, which we kind of reached the end of the presentation too. Again, there's a list of resources on the PDF that you've been given to. Um, several of them are blogs and Facebook pages that I personally follow that have lots of great information. Diary of a Mom is really, really awesome. Carla's ASD page is really awesome. The Autism Discussion page is great, and he's actually published his Facebook pages as books. There's a lot of dense information in there. The one I did not include on there is actually the one my son and I uh, run. It's called JT's Journey, so capital J, capital T, apostrophe S, Journey, um, and that is a page on Facebook. Um, we don't really have a blog yet. So I know we're hitting right up on 4.30. Nobody's had any questions up to this point. Again, if anybody has questions, I'm welcoming them. If you think of questions later, by all means, um, there's an email here on this page. You can go ahead and shoot me an email. I would love to reminisce, share stories and insights, talk about what works and what doesn't work, see if any of my insights could help what's happening at your facility and change the experience for your campers. Um, and if you have any specific feedback about this presentation, I'd welcome that too. So, if anybody has any questions, I'm more than open to answer them. Or any personal stories or experiences um, with specific autistic campers. Um, this is really relevant because if you've been following the research, the Center for Disease Control continues to increase um, the number of children who are diagnosed with autism. And what's interesting about that is that the statistics, the last one is one in every 55 students, one in every 55 children has autism, that's one in every 55 eight-year-olds. That's not one in 55 children in the universe, that's eight-year-olds. Those children are young and they're still growing and they're going to start coming to be our campers. Even if your medical forms are not reflecting that your campers have an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis or label, one in 55 means that you probably already have them. And the strategies that you're going to use to meet their needs really benefit all of your campers, not just those campers who are living with an autism spectrum diagnosis or label. So again, if anybody has any questions, feel free to contact me directly or um, through Dan, and we should be able to answer those questions. Thanks so much, Lorelai. And we are running right up on 430. Uh, I appreciate you giving everybody your contact information so those questions that come up later can can still be uh, addressed. And, and you know, it's, this is the second time I've seen your presentation and I, it just, it hits me in such a way that I know I've had a lot of students in the past where I, I tried to kind of make my group the same, you know? I tried to have them all line up with the same expectations and the same behavior standards. And this really makes me kind of second guess uh, my approach to that. There can, there can be some structure, sure, but parameters to really create an inclusive environment in ways that I, I honestly hadn't thought about before I, I've, I've heard this presentation. So thank you so much for sharing 
and looking very forward to seeing you in October at the conference and, and perhaps mm-hmm. having you on for, uh, you know, part two of something like this in the future. So thanks so much for giving us your time and uh, sharing your stories and your insights. I appreciate the opportunity to advocate for my son and for all those who live with autism. Thank you very much.